This is a helper video for the Sims 1 lab class working in Module 5. I'm calling this Slope Plot Area Worksheet Number 3. The first part of the worksheet asks you to find the slope of the following points. Remember, we've covered this on both Worksheet 1 and Worksheet 2, that in order to find the slope, you take the difference of the y values over the difference of the x values. Remember that your coordinate pairs are always given x, y, x, y. They always go in alphabetical order. If you can reduce your fraction, please do. And remember, a negative over a negative is a positive. But one negative and one positive gives you a negative answer for your slope. Good luck. Try problems 1 through 4. The next section of worksheet number 3 asks you to identify the slope and the y-intercept of each of the following equations. The first thing you need to remember is, what does slope-intercept form look like? Once you remember what it looks like, you need to remember which piece identifies the slope and which piece identifies the y-intercept. We covered this on the second worksheet. What we looked at, again, is the fact that slope-intercept form in general is y equals mx plus b. Remember that the x helps you identify where your slope is lo located, but the x value is not part of the slope. Only the m is the slope, and it represents the rise over run. That's a ratio, and it tells you how steep your line is, or how shallow. If it's a positive slope, your line should look like it's climbing. If it's a negative slope, your line will look like it's falling down. The B value is your y-intercept. Remember, it's part of the coordinate pair represented by 0B. The 0, because B is on the y-axis, the one that goes vertically. So now you should have enough information to answer problems 5 through 10. Alright, here we go. We need to plot these points and you're going to go down the list. That means you're going to begin here at 2, 0. You're going to go down. Now notice this time I have a break in the line. That means you're going to connect these four pieces. Then you're going to start a new line here at 2, 2. You're going to keep going down. Oh, here's another break. That means you're going to connect these five pieces and then you're going to start a new line here at negative 2, negative 1. You're going to connect all of these pieces and all of these pieces before you get to another break. So do not connect these two points to each other. Start again here at the one and a half one. Connect all of these pieces and don't forget it loops back to the original one and a half one to complete the picture. Remember key things that you need to know. We looked at this on worksheet number one. On worksheet number one, remember when we made this star? We talked about the fact that your x value tells you whether you should go to the left or the right. Your y value tells you whether you should go down or go up. So for instance, if I had the coordinate pair 1, 3, 1 is positive, I go to the right. 3 is positive, I go up. So please be very, very careful. The other thing we talked about it is the fact that you need to figure out the best location for your x and y axes. Remember that in order to do that, you need to look at your highest and lowest x value, your highest and lowest y value, use some logic to decide where your axes should go. Remember, these grids are 9 by 9. That's all the room I've given you. The picture will fit, but you need to be very, very careful. For problems 11 and 12, I'm letting you know again that these are regular shapes. One, two, three, four, five, six sides on this shape. What's the vocabulary term for that? That's right, it's a hexagon. And it's a regular hexagon. Regular means that all the sides and all the angles have the same measure. When we worked on worksheet number two, I showed you two possible methods for finding the area of a regular hexagon. Let's review that. We originally talked about the idea of taking our hexagon and splitting it 
into the different triangles that exist. And then we could use the area formula for this triangle, which is base times height divided by 2, find the area of that single triangle, and then because we know there are six triangles in the entire picture, we could take the area of that single triangle and multiply by 6 to get the area of the entire hexagon. The second method that we talked about is simply using the area formula, which some of you have learned. Area is equal to one-half multiplied by the apothem, multiplied by the length of one side of your regular polygon, multiplied by the number of sides that your regular polygon has. For this example, the apothem had a length of two and a half meters. That's where this two and a half comes from. The length of one side was given as five meters. That's where this five comes from. And again, because it's a regular hexagon, hex means six, that's where the six comes from. Again, it's the number of sides on your shape. And then you simply need your calculator, or a really good brain, multiply them all together. Please be careful. Area, remember, is always whatever units we're measuring in squared. Good luck. All right. Here we go. We're going to find the area of this irregular shape. This one's going to be very interesting to color in, isn't it? Do you remember the process where we used two different colors? I'll give you a really quick reminder so you don't have to go back and find the other video. Remember that all of the boxes that are completely contained within your irregular shape get colored in one color. Count them. Then all of the boxes that the irregular shape actually travels through you should color a second color and count them. What do we do with those pieces on the outside? That's right, we're going to divide them by two. And then we're going to take those two pieces of information and add them together to get the area, approximately, of our irregular shape. But if you notice, I've given you two new questions after your shape. Question 14 says, now what if I tell you that each grid on this picture represents 10 square meters? How many square meters does your lake cover if you assume this is a picture of a lake? Well, I'm not going to do your assignment for you, so let's look at worksheet number one and what would happen if each of those were 10 square meters. Alright, do you remember when we talked about how to do conversions? One way to solve this problem is with conversions, and this is really good practice for you. So if I tell you that one grid square is equivalent to 10 square meters, and I know that my picture covers 10 grid squares, right, that's why I said it was 29 units squared, remember that I want to be able to cross-cancel my common label so I take the grid square label from here, and I put it down here. I hope you don't mind. I abbreviated GS for grid squares. And according to this piece of information, for every one grid square that I have, I know that they represent 10 meters squared. So when I look at this, I now know that these labels of grid squares will cancel out, and the label I wanted of meter squared is what I'm left with. Now remember, the only thing you have left to do is multiply straight across. 29 multiplied by 10 is 290, and then I'm going to put on my label of meters squared. 1 times the invisible 1 under here is also 1, and 290 divided by 1 is... 290 meters squared is the area that this particular picture would represent if this were representing a lake on a map. Okay, so now you use that information to come back and you finish problem number 13, kind of looks like a dinosaur footprint, but let's pretend it's a lake and see if you can figure out how many square meters it covers. Then you're going to try it again, but with 15 square meters. Be careful.